Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and I appreciate the invitation to come. Um, it's a, a really interesting moment uh, to look at the history of civil wars uh, in general and the history of the American Civil War in particular because as many of you know, we are about to celebrate the 150th anniversary, the sesquicentennial uh, of the Civil War uh, period. We're about to have a raft uh, of commemorations beginning in a month uh, with the uh, anniversary of Lincoln's election to the presidency, then with the um, anniversary of secession, the anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War, the anniversary of emancipation, and uh, so on and so on, Appomattox and Reconstruction. Uh, I have to say, as someone who teaches and writes about this period and lectures about it, I feel exhausted uh, just thinking about what's ahead. Um, I should add that the last time that there was a big celebration was in 1960, when we celebrated the 100th, the centennial of the Civil War. And at that time, historians uh, uh, congratulated themselves on having solved all of the major issues. They felt that there was nothing more really to discuss and that they could move on to another subject. This, of course, was on the eve of the explosion of scholarship that reshaped our understanding of the middle period in the 19th century, the meaning of the war, its place in world history, which only reminds us that historians ought to stay uh, focused on what they're good at, which is looking at the past rather than at uh, projecting uh, into the future. Um, this moment, 150 years ahead, uh, is a very different one than in 1960. Clearly, many issues that were relevant at the time of the Civil War have resurfaced. Even issues that I thought were effectively buried about secession and nullification and interposition and so on and so forth are now up for discussion and debate. I'll just um, say that for those of us, all of us, as history teachers and as history writers, um, this is uh, an important time uh, for us in our schools and in our communities because I think we can play a significant role in at least helping to promote thoughtful and meaningful discussions. It's going to be a very wild ride for the next numbers of years. And um, aside from reining in some complete craziness, um, I think we can um, uh, have a very good effect on uh, what uh, the public can learn uh, and how it can think about our past. Um, what I'd like to do today, uh, in the uh, brief time I have, and I'd like to leave some time for your own questions if you have them, is to uh, throw in my own two cents and to reflect on the meaning of the Civil War. And I want to do it in a somewhat unusual way. The Civil War, of course, rivets our attention for many reasons, uh, in part because of the scale of the war, and in part, of course, because it reminds us of troubling things about the American past. After all, for the most part, we tend to celebrate uh, our political institutions. Uh, we think about American exceptionalism in terms of the early establishment of political democracy in the United States and the ability of Americans to settle differences uh, within institutional means rather than resorting to endless conflict. Uh, the Civil War doesn't really fit uh, very well into that uh, narrative. Uh, we know that not only did our political institutions fail us, but as a result, we killed each other in historical proportions, world historical. Indeed, I think as someone is, has or will be talking about, uh, the Civil War is the uh, bloodiest war of the entire 19th century world except for the Taiping uh, Rebellion uh, in, in China. Uh, with all of this, I think the Civil War has this aura uh, of tragedy surrounding it. That it is something that, however significant it was, uh, we ought to um, feel very sobered about. And the aura of tragedy also suggests that uh, perhaps it would have been better if we didn't have a civil war. If we managed to settle the outstanding issues of that war without resort uh, 
to violence and to military means. Uh, it would have been better if the war could have been avoided. Um, now, for those who think about that, uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, what the United States might have been like if there had not been a civil war, or if the civil war had ended up differently. Uh, in a sense, what I'd like to do is make a little bit of an excursion into what you might call counterfactual history, which I hope uh, does not end up seeming preposterous, but actually seems thought-provoking. Um, and so the idea is, what if uh, there was no war, or what if uh, the war uh, ended up in something other than an unconditional victory on the part of the Union side. Now, clearly one of the keys for understanding the significance of the American Civil War in the course of our history is to get some sense of what the country looked like on the eve of America's Civil War. Now, the conventional narrative tends to suggest that from the time of American independence, roughly to the time of the Civil War, that slavery and the power of slaveholders was receding in American life. That slavery was increasingly confined to one section of the country. That the South was assuming a minority status. And that power was shifting clearly uh, to the Northeast and to the Midwest, a world in which uh, American society was undergoing the early phases of urbanization and an industrial revolution. This, I think, is also part of the great narrative that is increasingly governing our view of the past, which is what you might call the slavery to freedom narrative, a narrative that acknowledges uh, America's deep impl implication and involvement with slavery, but does talk about uh, its uh, steady uh, decline. Uh, in truth, I think this is a misrepresentation of what the United States did in fact look like on the eve of the Civil War. I would suggest that slavery, rather than being a sectional institution, was a national institution. That the South, and slaveholders in particular, wielded up to the end disproportionate power uh, in the federal government and in the nation as a whole. That Southern slaveholders were among the richest of Americans, that the wealthiest counties in the United States were in the slave states, and that even at the time of the Civil War, the slaveholding planters in the South were the wealthiest and most powerful landed elite anywhere in the world at the time. The North, I should suggest too, was still predominantly a rural and small town society. Yes, more people were living in cities. Yes, manufacturing was beginning to take off. But in Lincoln's America, it could still be imagined that uh, people would mostly be involved in their shops, in their farms, petty production uh, on a wide uh, scale. In any, if anything, the advance of manufacturing and the advance of uh, economic uh, diversification was being held in check politically by slaveholders and their allies. Now the question is, how is that possible? How in fact could slavery and the South been as strong uh, as they apparently were? Let me mention a number of things that we need to recognize. One, uh, I think as many of us know or recall, that in the 17th and 18th century, slavery was a, uh, an experience that covered the North American and indeed the South American continent. And that in what became the United States, slavery was legal in all of the colonies. And at the time of the American Revolution, all of those areas uh, that were about to become states. We've also learned in recent scholarship that rather than being marginal to economic and political life in the North, that slavery was much more central to how the economy functioned and a much higher proportion 
of people who were involved in the mainstream of economic and civil life either owned slaves or benefited directly from it. But even more important in terms of the picture up to the Civil War is that slavery was abolished in the northern states beginning around 1780 in a gradual fashion. With rare exception, not one of the emancipation statutes in the northern states freed any slave. They freed the children of slaves and only when they reached the age of 21 or 25 or 28, depending on their gender and depending on the particular state. What this meant uh, was that there were slaves in the North, people who were officially slaves, uh, well into the 19th century. A recent study has shown that they were in New Jersey as late as 1860 and that virtually every state in the North and Midwest had to abolish slavery a second time because the status of people who were slaves was so ambiguous and large numbers of them were being forced to enter lifetime indentures uh, as they got out of slavery. New York abolished slavery again in 1827. New Jersey in uh, 1846. Connecticut and Illinois in 1848, the last state to abolish slavery for the second time was New Hampshire in 1857. Along with this, there was, of course, the Fugitive Slave Law, passed first in 1793 and then in a tougher form in 1850. What the Fugitive Slave Law meant was that the status of enslavement attached to the body of the slave and not to the place of their enslavement. Any slave who tried to escape to freedom, in fact, brought the status of enslavement with him or with her, was always vulnerable to being captured and returned into slavery. And the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law made it clear that the federal government was on the side of slaveholders rather than on the side of slaves. The Constitution um, established what is known as the federal ratio, which counted slaves as three-fifths of a white person for the purposes of apportionment, and in, a, in effect, rewarded slaveholders with more representation than any other people in the United States. It gave them tremendous strength in congressional elections and tremendous strength in presidential elections. It's why slaveholders were able pretty much to dominate the, Demo the Democratic Party uh, for most of the antebellum period, why they were able to dominate the presidency. Now think about it. Uh, most presidents, up to Abraham Lincoln, were southern slaveholders or northerners who were sympathetic to them, if we accept the Adams family. Southerners and slaveholders also dominated the diplomatic corps and the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, could you hit the um, first map, the one on the right-hand side? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's really striking is that virtually every, um, this is a map of what the United States was and what the rest of North America looked like in 1800. Uh, one of the things that's you know, really interesting is that virtually every piece of territory that came into the possession of the United States in the first half of the 19th century came under the auspices of a slaveholding president. Louisiana in 1803, Thomas Jefferson. Florida in 1820, uh, James Monroe. Then we have Texas. Then we have the uh, Southwest, the Oregon country, all under the auspices of uh, presidents who were slaveholders and for the most part who believed, like Jefferson did, that slavery would be legal in these new territories. Indeed, increasingly, uh, Southern political leaders and slaveholders in general envisioned not simply a continental um, experience of slavery, but indeed a massive slaveholding empire. They not only looked west, but they looked south. They were interested in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, especially Cuba. As one of them put it, Cuba is our Gibraltar. It's the Gibraltar of the American Mediterranean. 
Then, of course, there is the Dred Scott decision of 1857, which you will recall, <coughs> without going over the details of the case, uh, not only said that African Americans could not be citizens of the United States, whether they were slave or whether they were free, that a slave had no standing in America's court, but the Dred Scott decision also ruled that slavery could not be excluded from federal territories. Could you click on the other map? Uh, which meant that um, all of these, this area in the Trans-Mississippi West uh, would be open uh, to uh, slaveholders moving in and becoming uh, political powers. At the same time, there were cases coming up through the courts about what would happen if a slaveholder who was living in Virginia and wanted to go to Texas, and the fastest way to do that was to go take a ship in New York, and the slaveholder took his slave through New York, would the slave be free if the slave entered New York because slavery was theoretically illegal? Would the slave become free or could the slaveholder decide to spend a few months in New York? It raised the question of whether it was going to be possible under the Constitution as slaveholders and their allies were interpreting it to exclude slavery anywhere. When Lincoln got up and gave his house divided speech that the United States could not long remain half slave and half free, he was warning about the nationalization of slavery. And this was not an idle threat. It was a threat that loomed. Uh, a historian named Don Fehrenbacher, a very distinguished one, wrote a book describing the United States in this period as a slave-holding republic. And there was a lot of evidence to support that view. Now, could there have been some different outcome? Um, history, as we all know, oftentimes has an aura of inevitability uh, about it. It seems that what happened had to happen. There are no alternatives to it. The question is, could there have been a different outcome, or could there have been a set of circumstances where, in fact, the war didn't happen? I think it's important to make a distinction in the way in which we look at the past and to try to separate out the large historical forces which create sets of possibilities to the particular political contingencies that determine which way things go. The Civil War and secession was a product of politics and of the failure of politics. And as we know, small things can make a big difference. Hindsight is, a great, of, is of great advantage to historians, but it's also a problem because we know what happened. But people at the time didn't necessarily know. In 1860-61, as the secession crisis began to unfold, remember, we had been there before. There was the great crisis over the admission of Missouri in 1820. There was the great crisis over nullification in the 1830s. There was the so-called Compromise of 1850. And there was bleeding Kansas, when in some ways we had a dress rehearsal for civil war at that particular point. Could the war have been avoided? Well, I think there are reasonable scenarios. Uh, some of them have to do with simple, small decisions. The President of the United States was a man by the name of James Buchanan uh, from Pennsylvania, who happened to be well-liked by Southern slaveholders. He was the one who supported, some of you may recall, the Lecompton Constitution, which would admit Kansas as a free state. But James Buchanan decided not to run for re-election. Now, after Andrew Jackson, Mo, no president until Lincoln actually served two terms, but he was entitled to. Had Buchanan decided to run again, the Democratic Party would not have been divided and the outcome of the election might have been different. It's also conceivable that after the southern states 
or at least the lower South, seceded from the Union. Remember, it's a two-stage process. The states of the lower South, beginning with South Carolina, go out first. But the states of the upper South don't go so quickly. Uh, it's not, it was entirely possible that Lincoln could have decided not to defend Fort Sumter. There was some reason, there was some talk of him abandoning the fort, as he had abandoned other forts, and as William Seward was advising him to do, in which case secession, I mean, uh, the war would have been uh, postponed. There was an enormous amount of pressure on Abraham Lincoln to do just that. Even more likely, the war could have ended differently. The South could have forced the North to give up early on, and almost did, in which case you would have had two countries, which might have seemed like a solution at the time, but remember, they were still going to be competing over the Trans-Mississippi West, and that the conflicts were likely to erupt. What's more, and probably the most likely scenario, is that uh, the Civil War would have ended with an armistice rather than with the unconditional surrender of the Confederacy. Now rem remember too that the Civil War dragged on for a long time. When the Civil War began, both sides thought it was going to be over very, very quickly, and it wasn't. There was growing disaffection in the Union side and in the Northern states. Lincoln faced opposition uh, from the Democratic Party, indeed opposition from his own party. George McClellan ran as the Democratic nominee in 1864 on a peace platform. And by the, even as late as the summer and early fall of 1864, Lincoln was afraid that he was going to lose. Indeed, in many ways, unconditional surrender uh, was probably the least likely outcome. And as we know from the history of, the civil, of civil wars in many places, some sort of cobbled together truce, armistice, some agreement, which often breaks down, <clears throat> is the more accustomed outcome. Now, in the event that the war hadn't happened, either because we managed to reach a compromise or because secession was postponed, or because the war didn't explode when it did, or even if the war ended up differently with some sort of armistice. Um, certainly, some of the bloodshed would have been avoided. Some of the destruction might have been contained. But it's important to mention a number of things <clears throat> that might have been the case. And it's important for us to think about it when we contemplate what the Civil War meant and whether it really mattered. <clears throat> Let me mention a few things. One is the future of slavery. Now, one way or another, the likelihood is whether the Confederacy was able to establish itself or whether an armistice was reached, that slavery at some point probably would have been abolished but it would have been abolished very differently than it was. It would have been abolished gradually because that was the way in which virtually all slave societies abolished slavery. It was done that way because there were doubts about whether the slaves were ready for freedom and mostly because there were concerns about compensating slaveholders for their losses. I should add that there's a lot of discussion about compensation, but no discussion about compensation for slaves. When Lincoln was first imagining a plan of emancipation as president, he imagined a 35-year emancipation that would have left slaves in the United States into the early 20th century. And that's under Lincoln. At the very least, remember, there would have been no 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Secondly, the federal government would not have been able to secure its authority over the country that was very much in dispute or redefine relationships between the nation and individuals. 
there would have been no 14th Amendment to the Constitution, no idea of a national citizenship and who, in fact, was a citizen. Now, the Dred Scott decision in 1857 said that African Americans could not be citizens of the United States. But it didn't say who could be citizens of the United States, because at that point, the question of citizenship was very unclear. There would have been no 14th Amendment, no civil rights bills that at least began to lay out what sort of rights and expectations former slaves might have had. Uh, Dred Scott would have remained the law of the land. There would have been no Reconstruction Acts which enfranchised African American men in the South, nor would there have been a 15th Amendment to the Constitution which effectively enfranchised African American men in the North where individual states refused to do it. The language of racial exclusion, which could be found in most state constitutions up until the Civil War, would have remained. Thirdly, slaveholders would have been left to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom, <coughs> and the federal government would have supplied the resources to enable them to do that. As a result, slaveholders would have gained home rule. They would have continued to contr control their local and state governments. And they would have had the opportunity to impose their solution to the problem of slavery. Many of you recall that one of the things they did under presidential reconstruction that Andrew Johnson uh, framed was to enact black codes that were so draconian and violated the sense of what the Civil War was about so fully that the federal government forced their retraction. Had there not been a war or had it ended up differently, black codes would have effectively organized whatever transition from slavery to freedom there was. There would have been past laws, corporal punishment, the denial of African Americans the right to own land and practice uh, the professions. And more so, they would have been excluded from public facilities and denied social services. Oftentimes when we think of the Jim Crow period, we think that the oppositions were integration and segregation. In fact, integration wasn't even on the table. The oppositions in the late 19th century were segregation and outright exclusion. And exclusion would have been uh, the outcome. Slaveholders and former slaveholders under these circumstances uh, would have remained a powerful force in national politics with notable effects on the American political economy with complicated ways of thinking about it. Uh, industrialization uh, and economic consolidation likely would have been slowed down because that was the block of opposition to modernization within the American economy. The interests of agricultural property owners would have been strengthened and we would have seen a major shift in the dynamic of the American political economy. What happens after the Civil War is that the alliance that runs the country link the Northeast and the Midwest. That is the result of the Civil War. And it also means that the Northeast gets to write the history of the Civil War. Had there been no war, and had it, or had it ended up differently, the dominant alliance would likely have linked the South and the Trans-Mississippi West with very different implications for our sense of what happened and for the future. What's more, remember, in terms of political life, what would have happened to the Republican Party? The Republican Party was a new party in the 1850s, and it was a sectional party. Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in most of the southern states, I mean, in a sense, the election of 1860 was two elections, one in the North and one in the South. 
the Republican Party was not going to go anywhere <clears throat> unless it figured out how to be a national rather than a sectional party. Had there not been a civil war, had it ended up differently, the likelihood is that instead of two major parties, you would have looked at a multi-party a political system. Not necessarily a bad thing, but certainly a very different thing. And finally, internationally, such an outcome <clears throat> would likely have bolstered slaveholding interests elsewhere in the hemisphere. We have to remember that at the time of the American Civil War, although slavery had been abolished through various means in the French and English possessions, slavery was very much alive in Cuba as well as in Brazil. When the Civil War ended and the Confederacy was defeated, uh, it was pretty clear to slaveholders everywhere that the game was over. In fact, as it turns out, some of you may know, uh, renegade slaveholders after the Civil War, some of them went to Cuba and some of them went to Brazil. There's still a colony in Brazil which is descendants uh, of these slaveholders and, uh, who went there. And as a result, <clears throat> by the end of the 19th century, under these circumstances, the United States might have looked like a rather unattractive mix of Germany, South Africa, Brazil, and much of the rest of Latin America. Uh, it's quite possible that the country we know would in fact have broken up into many, many different parts. This is what Lincoln and other sympathetic Republicans feared in 1861 when they had to decide what to do about secession and what to do uh, about the resistance that the Confederacy was putting up. Lincoln's fear is that if you let them go, the entire nation is going to collapse and that you would have an assortment of republics rather than just one or two. After all, this was the outcome of the Latin American independence movements of the early 19th century. That, or perhaps you would have had a loose federal system, much looser than it ended up, in which effective national power would be shared between big landowners in the South and the West and big industrialists in the Northeast and Midwest. It would have been an American version of what in German history they call the marriage of iron and rye, which linked Prussia with the industrialized Rhineland. We might also have had a multi-tiered uh, structure of civil and political standing in our society in which rights were effectively determined not by a national government, but in fact by states and localities and in which African Americans and other ethnic groups would have been officially regarded as second-class citizens, and in which democratic rights and practices would have been rolled back. Why do I think that? Because that was already happening in the 1850s. Remember, this is a decade that not only sees the defeat of appeals on the part of northern blacks and then um, uh, women for equal political rights, but this is also a decade in which there's mass mobilization around nativism and an effort to deprive immigrants of civil and political standing. And it doesn't only happen in backwoods areas, it happens in places like Massachusetts. This was on the horizon for the United States before the Civil War. And finally, I think what you would be looking toward by the end of the 19th century is a possible system of national social separation in which the burdens of social services rested mostly on the shoulders of various subject populations, uh, an American version of South African apartheid. Now, of course, it's difficult to predict clearly what might have happened, but it's important nonetheless for us to recall the various things that the Civil War and its outcome enabled and what may have been missing if 
the Civil War didn't happen, or if in more likely, it had ended up differently. And so I would just finish by suggesting that rather than seeing the Civil War itself as a tragedy, we might think of the real tragedy as being a legacy of a Civil War that was either never fought or never won.